Hey folks, Zach Osprey here, Iowa Insider Indianapolis Store. This is Mind Your Manners. Should we call this Mind Your Manners Weekly? We're doing a lot more of these now, Mike. We've expanded our, our podcast options, our podcast offerings. This is Mind Your Manners for Thursday, November 7th, 2024. It's about 2.30 uh, on Thursday afternoon. He is Mike Noslick of the Bloomington Herald Times. I'm Zach Osterman of the Indianapolis Star. Mike, we got a lot to get through, so let's just dive right in. Um, we're going to just do some quick final thoughts we discussed in depth on our postgame podcast, Indiana 80, uh, SIU Edwardsville 61 on Wednesday night. That's already live on the feed wherever you listen to your podcast. Please go check it out if you are so inclined and haven't already. Um, but, Mike, um, just kind of I, I, any basically any final thoughts from you on last night, what you saw, offense, defense, rotations, um, you know, the way Indiana won, anything that kind of stuck with you when you woke up this morning? Not particularly. Like you said, I mean, I think we talked about it last night that it was, you know, one game and th this team is going to probably be a little more of a work in progress than um, maybe Mike Woodson wants. Um, but I think the ur there's more urgency to get it fixed out just because, you know, they don't have a very hard non-conference schedule. So, um, you know, I'm not sure how much, you know, not a lot of practice time in between, you know, game here on on Sunday so I mean how do you kind of get that ramped up quickly because I think you want to win some of these games a little more convincingly um with the schedule they have in front of them especially with Battle for Atlantis being sort of a crapshoot and where you don't know what you're going to get and it might not be very hard yeah you, know, you could get a good good draw but on the other hand you might not you said you if you're in the ante you kind of want to iron out some of the wrinkles quickly I, I wonder though if or, or you brought up, I guess, concurrent to that, the non-conference schedule. I wonder if the non-conference schedule in a weird way benefits them just in the sense that it does give them some runway to make some mistakes. And I know what you're saying about efficiency metrics, margin of victory. Obviously, you know, last night was nowhere near some of the trouble Indiana had last season when they were, you know, in one possession games in the last like two, three minutes with teams like Army and, and Wright State. It still could have been a lot better, um, but it wasn't. It wasn't specifically the problem Indiana had a year ago. But you talk about like practice time. I mean, you know, Indiana gets three days between SAU Edwardsville and Eastern Illinois. Then it gets an entire week between Eastern Illinois and South Carolina. And it gets a Saturday to Thursday between South Carolina and UNC Greensboro. And it gets a Thursday to Wednesday between Greensboro and its first game in Atlanta. It's like there actually is – more breathing room in this schedule. And I understand people who, whether it's because they want to see marquee matchups as fans, season ticket holders, or because they're worried about Indiana's, you know, non-conference sort of strength of schedule and how that affects their NCAA tournament resume. I understand people who, who wanted to see this team challenge itself more in the non-conference, but I actually look at this four game stretch before Atlantis. And I kind of wonder if it isn't, if it doesn't benefit Indiana the way that it falls, or at least I don't want to say benefit Indiana because they have to take advantage of it. But if it doesn't offer Indiana a little bit of wiggle room to ease into this season, fix some of those mistakes, find some of that rhythm, and then, you know, maybe hope it can go up from, let's say, first gear to second gear at least for those games in, in the Bahamas. That's possible, but, I mean, they can't get tripped up, right? I mean, you know, no, they, then, no, they can't. But, that, but that, I mean, that's true no matter what. Like, even South Carolina, I think, is going to wind up being a game they can't lose. Yeah, and so, I mean, I guess that's probably the ultimate lit litmus test uh, in terms of how this all, you know, unfolds. I mean, I, I just think they need to – I think the, the talent needs to speak for itself, and that's kind of what we talked about last night. It's just that this – you know, whether you play together or not, it's like on a – it's not like if you're playing a pickup game, um, these guys should walk on the floor and win 10 straight, right? It's not like – it's it's – and I don't know. I just feel like this roster is so overly talented than what they have on the schedule that um, it shouldn't matter that, you know, the pick and roll is not down right or, you know, they're not switching right. You know, it just those things should be secondary to, to how much talent they have, I guess. Which is, I mean, I get that, but it's this team has just not had that much time on task together. Like, you know, I mean, I thought it was interesting how good Indiana looked offensively when Trey Galloway was on the floor, particularly in that second half. He scores five points, but he has six of his nine assists in that second half in just nine minutes. He's got the third highest plus minus 
um, of anybody on uh, the team in the if, if we if we narrow this down to the second half and the second half only, um, the only players with a higher plus minus in the second half than him are McKenzie and Baco, who scores twelve of his thirty one points in the second half, and Umar Balo, who's who's actually got the best plus minus of any any Indiana player in the second half alone in that game. And I think a decent amount of that is because Balo finds that rhythm in the pick and roll game with Trey Galloway. What I'm trying to say here is Indiana brings in a lot of new faces. It's trying to fit, a, 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 you know, it's trying to fit in a very talented center, but not one that plays this position the way certainly offensively in particular, anybody it's had before ever has. Um, it's trying to break in a new point guard who clearly has a ton of talent. Miles Rice looks really good in the Tennessee exhibition. He had some good moments last night as well. He also had the five turnovers. I think he's trying to find this team's pace, its rhythm. You know, it's it's there's always kind of a, a mountain meeting Muhammad moment with a point guard where it's sort of like, what is a team, what can he demand of his teammates versus what does he need to do for them, if you understand what I'm saying? And the guy that I think would provide this the most steadying force in sort of papering over some of these cracks or or maybe the better, maybe the the, the better metaphor is closing some of these gaps, because that's what Indiana needs to be trying to do here from a long-term perspective is Trey Galloway and Galloway is obviously still easing back in from the knee surgery and the recovery from the knee surgery. And it's just interesting to me that I think Indiana looks best when Galloway is running the show in the second half yesterday offensively. And I just, I, I know what you're saying about aggregate talent, but you and I both know when you have a team that's got what three new starters and, you know, if we look at the rotations last night of the 10 Indiana players that get on the floor, one, two, three, four, five, is it six? Rice, Carlisle, Ballo, Tucker, Goody, Hatton, none of those players were Hoosiers a year ago. Like the synergy that is necessary for this team to realize this, this sort of potential future of everybody's so talented and they can score from anywhere and they're really dynamic. Like that just isn't going to happen overnight. But to, to okay, but so uh, the flip side, of that, did uh, Bello look like a player that had played 133 career games last night? I I don't think he did until he was with Trey Galloway, and then he did. Like when he was when he was running that that two man game with Galloway, that was when I think you well, saw. Yeah, sure, but I'm saying like he should. I, I'm just saying that I. That I feel like that's making more excuses than the team than than the players. You know, Miles Rice was the the Pac-12 freshman of the year last year. Um, you know, it's right? Just not, not, but he was the Pac-12 freshman of the year because he was playing for a different team. I think you're making excuses in November because in early November, no team should be fully formed, and this one very clearly needs some time. If we're still well, having this, I just know a guy. I just know a guy that's across the street that doesn't believe in any excuses. I'm just you're saying gonna hold everybody to this, aren't you? We're gonna be talking I'm about like saying. IU softball in the spring, and you're gonna be like, you know, if Kurt Signetti were the coach of the IU softball team. No, no but I mean, mean I, I think it's a, I think it's a fair point. He didn't come in here and be like, well, he did five practices. He's like, I, I want think, wins I now. Think football and basketball are, are two different animals, and football's more challenging in some ways, but it's 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 much more of an assembly line in some others. Basketball is a more free flowing and amoebic game. And I'm not sure comparing Kurt Signetti's work in. A <laughs> I'm not saying he can go in there and and coach him up and 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 go undefeated. Do you remember uh, years ago when Michigan State, like somebody floated the idea of Tom Izzo coaching the football team at Michigan coaching State? Football, yes, I do remember yeah. that. Yes, I don't remember who it was, but I think we should bring that back. The idea of multi coach coaches. <laughs> um. No, but my point is, is you start going down that road, and it's like, well, they need they need uh, two months to be, you know, good. It, you know, it's just, I, I don't know. I just feel like that that goes out the window when you've assembled, like I said, this team that the built that's built the way it is. Because your bench is even starters from other teams. Like I, I just don't know how. Like you want to, you know, yes, they're new to each other, but it's not like they're new to basketball. I mean, that's fair, but again, a, a basketball team is is much more of like a live organism than, than in most sports. Like you, it's all about timing and rhythm and feel and the game doesn't stop after every single play, the way it does in baseball, the way it does in football. Like you, you need time on task together before you can. And yes, you can have 
off-season workouts and you can have preseason practices and even preseason games, that's not going to solve everything. And that, like longtime listeners to this podcast will know one of my favorite basketball coaching cliches comes from Kelvin Sampson. He used to say, you don't play February basketball in November. And what he was saying is, you should not be fully formed in the early part of the season. You should not yeah, be, you be playing. Which, it, an extension of that is you shouldn't be playing August basketball in November. I, I'm not sure this team is playing August basketball. I think time will tell us whether it is or not. If we get to January 15th and we're still having these conversations, then yeah, it's a I didn't say they were, but I'm like, you're just like, well, if they, you know, if they're just, if they don't know what they're doing, it's okay. I mean, I don't, first of all, Matt, Matt, Matt here. Much, thank you, Matt. I agree. Matt says, I agree with Mike. I didn't watch the game, but when I saw the final score, I was shocked against SIU Edwardsville, which is a bad team by every metric. There's reason for alarm. Uh, uh, the Ken Pump numbers do not love SIU Edwardsville. They agree with uh, you and with Mark, at least to a certain extent. They're 315 in Ken Pump. I would Matt, point out please, please they have a winning record each of the last two years. So for their level, they're pretty much 500, and the OVC is not a terrible conference. So, like, Let's not treat them like Indiana was playing Edgewood or Bloomington South, and they just had the the overwhelming whatever. Like I, I just like I, I just think, and I'm going to get in trouble one of these days when I talk about Indiana playing one of the local high schools. I'm going to start talking about your local high school, <laughs> like when Indiana is playing Franklin Central or Center Grove, um, because that way people down here won't yell at me. But like I just. You need to see progress if you're Indiana. I totally get that. But you shouldn't look fully formed at this time of year, especially when you are you're, you're missing the, – the, the difference isn't that they're fully formed. It's that the idea that they have enough talent to blow bad teams out by 30, whether they're fully formed or not, because they have the tail level. I agree with you. They shouldn't be like – you know, these pick and roll shouldn't be like the Christmas thing, and every time down the floor they're running these amazing sets. Like, yeah, I get that that takes time. But like, I don't know that that they should have won that game by thirty five last night. I don't know if I'd say thirty five. I think Ken Pum had them by twenty four. So I they think I predicted them by like thirty three. The starters should not have been on the floor in the final two minutes because the game was fourteen points. Yeah, I agree with that. That I will agree with, and that is one of those things that does compound as the season goes along. If you can't, I think we saw that a little bit with Indiana last year when you can't get your guys off the floor. And and get some rest. You, about conserving, you mentioned conserving minutes for Mackenzie Ibaka when it came out when he was like torching everybody. Hey, a way to conserve minutes and the game with ten minutes to go. Yeah, I don't. The I don't. The, I don't street, the guy across the street would agree with me on that one. Well, to multi-sport coaches, <laughs> multi-sport coaches. That's where that's where we're taking this. So then he can um, inside both stadiums. They, they, they face each other. <laughs> um, any other business from SIU Edwardsville? I know, yeah. again, we covered a lot of this in the postgame podcast. It was a fun, um, spirited discussion. It was. It was. Um, after you stopped complaining about stuff. Anyway, um, last night you did. You were like, oh, but the light is so bright in this room, and I have to sit in the angle and the this and the that. No, I, I said I didn't want to stand. I didn't want to stand. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Brad's with you on, on pulling in Baco in the first half, and that one I think I agree with you on, in just in terms of, and, and, and like we've seen that with Mike Woodson at times before, where it's almost like, especially in the first half, he pre, it's, it's, it's like he's sort of got some substitutions almost pre planned, and it's like that first, it's that first roll in the first half. I think he's a lot more sort of, you know, feel his way through it, kind of, ride the game state in the second half, but in the first half, it's like, I want, especially in these games, I don't know if he'd do it, you know, against Arizona in the Bahamas, but in these games, it's much more like I'm going to time it out so that I roll through my reserves one time. One, I think to get his starters off the bench. I think two, and I think this maybe is another bit of an NBA thing as well, because in the NBA, you do tend to have sort of a defined first and second unit on most rosters. Um, the other reason I think he does it is because if for some reason he's got to pivot to like Langdon Hatton in the post late in the game, I think he wants, I think he, I think there's sort of this school of thought that says um, Langdon Hatton, you know, 
you don't want him to be walking on the floor for the first time with a minute and a half left in a close game. If you understand what I'm saying, no, and I agreed with that yesterday. Like I get why he did it. It's just the time he could have just not done that. Yeah, like that he could have, or he could have switched Mbako with somebody else. Or and listen, right. the other thing is like what we're not privy to is maybe Mbako's on some kind of restriction. Maybe there's some sort of sports science reason why he needs to sit at a certain time or whatever. But I broadly agree in the sense that we've seen Mike Woodson do that before where a guy kind of finds a little bit of offensive rhythm and then it's almost like in a, in a pre-planned way, Indiana pulls that player off the floor. Um, let's be done with basketball. Again, we did a lot of this on the post game show Wednesday night. Um, so listen to that. If you haven't big game this weekend, they're all kind of big games at this point, even the bucket game when you, you know, when the stakes are as high as they are for Indiana, um, Michigan's in town. This obviously is not the game we maybe thought it would be. If you'd sort of said Indiana's going to be nine and zero, and in the college football playoff, uh, you know, top twelve. You know, if somebody told you that on the eve of the first game of the season, you would have said, "Well, that Michigan game looks like a big one. That's probably their most impactful home game." Michigan has just really not held up its end of the bargain. Um, and I know we're not the Michigan football podcast, so we'll leave a lot of the reasons why to one side. Um, bigger picture, but the the sort of micro of this is Indian or Michigan has just not been very good offensively all year. They've had quarterback problems. I, I would argue that the quarterback problems have almost, at least when I've seen Michigan, have almost provided too much cover for some of their skilled players, who I don't think Colston Loveland aside have been consistent enough. And I think sometimes what happens is when you when you you know you have problems at like receiver or even a little bit at running back but you have problems at quarterback. Those overshadow everything else so much that everybody else almost kind of gets a semi-free pass. I, I don't think Michigan skilled players have played up to the level that, that they're capable of, that they need, need to this season. Um, but the one thing I will say more than anything else is, number one, this is the most NFL talent Indiana I think has seen across the line of scrimmage uh, in either direction yet this season. And number two, this is probably the toughest team along that line of scrimmage that Indiana has seen so far this season. Yeah, and um, you know, they got two on the defensive uh, front, uh, two potential first-round picks or two projected the guy, Mason Graham, and I forgot what the other I had. I wrote it last night. But um, so, um, you know, they got three guys with 20-plus quarterback pressures, um, very disruptive, and I think that's sort of the key for me. Like, yeah – um, as bad as their offense has been, um, you know, they hung around against Oregon, uh, you know, th- th- and that score wasn't sort of as crazy lopsided as, as you've seen, you know, um, some of their other games. So I think that this team, this defense is capable of tripping up Indiana's offense and keeping the game closer. I just don't think they'll be able to score 20 points. Um, you know, because I think in what Indiana's defense has done has been overshadowed by just sort of just the tremendous offensive success. And I think the defense is just as good. Um, you know, they set a record last week, um, held Michigan State to minus 36 rushing yards. Um, that's a single game program record. Uh, now they're first in rushing defense in the country. Uh, I think it's under, I think it's like around 76 yards holding teams. They've never, you know, in the last 30 years, they've only held opposing teams to under 150 yards in the season three times. I went back to 19, I think the college football reference one goes back to 1954. They had never held an opposing uh, offenses to under 100 yards in the season. So this would be something kind of historic, what they're doing in terms of rushing yards, you mean? Rushing yards, yeah. Um, Just really, uh, yeah, Kenneth Grant. Thank you, Ryan. Um, You you know, that. uh, that rushing defense is doing something has, that's never been done here in Indiana. So, um, uh, you know, I just don't think the Michigan's going to be able to score enough points, even if they keep, even if they keep uh, Indiana to around thirty. I think, uh, uh, like, if we start with kind of the offense defense matchup from Michigan's perspective, um, Michigan, obviously, sort of historically, you know, you, you, the Jim Harbaugh teams, even before that with Lloyd Carr. Um, run the ball really well. This team has struggled to do that. Um, They are 11th in the conference in rushing yards per attempt. Um, Obviously, this could be a function of overall offensive success, but they're tied for 12th in the conference in rushing touchdowns. If you look at their their sort of game logs rushing the football, um, there's some games in there 
300 against Arkansas State, uh, 290 against Southern Cal, which is I get that I get that like those are two big name programs, but Southern Cal's four and five now and clearly struggling. And Lincoln Riley never really figured out that defense uh, in his time in in L.A. And then they had the 174 in the loss at Washington in their last three games at Illinois, a win over Michigan State and at Oregon. They have rushed for 114, 119 and 105 yards. They've only rushed for two rushing touchdowns in those three games. And in none of those three games did they average at least even four yards per attempt, which is, is, I mean, that's, you know, under four yards per attempt is, is not a good number. I understand that like, if you in theory average like 3.9 yards per attempt and you run the ball at that rate, every single play, you'd get a first down, but we both know that's not how football works. And then when you get kind of out to the, the passing side of things, you know, they, they at least like seem to have sort of like settled on where they're going to go at quarterback a little bit more like it's Davis Warren, I think is the one that they're, unless I miss something that they're, no, that's not, like and he, hasn't, he had, he had six interceptions in the first three games. Hasn't turned the ball over since he's returned to the lineup. And I think that's a big reason why they've looked a little better uh, making yeah. less mistakes. He's been, uh, he's been relatively efficient. The the numbers, that. I mean, his overall numbers the last two weeks are, are, you know, very pedestrian. Now, they're not asking him to do a ton. They still rotate Alex Orgian to like run, uh, that who was the, one of the guys that they tried to go to to replace him. Uh, but Warren's the starter. Um, it's just not a very dynamic offense outside of, of, of the tight end. No. And again, I think this is, this is one of those areas where it, it, it you're going to have to like, what is the balance going to be between there's probably some NFL talent on that offensive line, but like the offense statistically is, is, not a lot better than the one that you absolutely smothered last weekend in East Lansing. I think the one thing it doesn't do is turn the ball over quite as consistently as as what obviously um, uh, Michigan State has had trouble with with Aiden Childs. But like, you know, what Indiana, we talked about this after the Michigan State game, something Indiana has been so successful with is this kind of offense defense dynamic where the offense starts scoring at a rate that forces opposing offenses to get out of what they're trying to do and make them feel like we have to press, we have to throw the ball, we have to get big chunk plays and score quickly because once Indiana's offense gets rolling, it doesn't stop. And so we have to, you know, we have to we have to track them down on the scoreboard before they get away from us. You know, this team is maybe not like statistically quite as mistake prone as Michigan State was. Like Michigan State, um, if I'm not mistaken, still leads the league in, in lost turnovers. Now, Michigan's not that far behind them, but as you talk about, they've been a little bit better lately. But, like, in terms of the offensive, the lack of offensive consistency, they're basically still right there. But they are there with, in all likelihood, in the aggregate, better players. So it's I think it's just a question of, like, when, like, basically how – you know, does does that talent shine through, or does Indiana just do with Michigan what it's done with Nebraska, what it's done with Michigan State, what it's done with other programs, other teams that you know just seem like they were not going to be able to keep pace with Indiana on the scoreboard? Um, another key I think we should talk about uh, they one of their best players, one of those first round picks, or, um, Will Johnson, cornerback, uh, missed last week. Uh, Jerome Moore did not sound particularly optimistic, said we'll see how the week goes. Their second quarterback was out as well. Uh, they're, they're both starters. Jair Hill was out. Um, sounds like he will play just based on Moore's comments at the start of the week. Obviously, things can change. But Johnson's absence uh, is big. And when you kind of look at what, you know, Michigan, an amazing stat to me. So they've allowed, uh, they're at the bottom, near the bottom of the country um, and uh, towards the bottom or I guess towards the middle, and explosive plays allowed 36, 20 plus, 20 plus yards or more. But last year in 15 games, they only allowed 32. So they've already exceeded that number. So obviously a, a, a much more leaky defense than they had a year ago, um, even though they've got talent up front and in the back end, but Will Johnson's absence would loom, loom large. And I think I I, I kind of um, – something that stood out to me with Kurt Signet last week is um, when you have a weakness – this is a coaching staff that's going to exploit that. You know, he talked about that they called for the punt block 
uh, um, uh, on, a, on a scheme that they don't usually, or on a look that they don't usually lose, uh, use because the backup long snapper was in and the operation was moving a little slower than normal. This is a coaching staff that's capable of, uh, of exploiting, you know, two backup cornerbacks or even a backup cornerback in the lineup. So I think that's a spot to look at, especially with Curtis Rourke, um, um, you know, looking pretty good. People are talking about the Ohio State game in the comments. We will get to that a little bit in the wider. I want to have a little bit of a wider discussion at the end about where Indiana is kind of in the playoff conversation. Um, but speaking about Michigan specifically, I thought it was interesting. Like I thought Oregon and Oregon did it in Ann Arbor, unless I'm mistaken. That game was was at Michigan. Um, I thought Oregon handed Indiana a pretty comfortable game plan for what to do with Michigan. They 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 threw the ball to the perimeter a lot. Like Kenneth Grant is great. I, for the record, I voted Kenneth Grant Big uh, Big Ten Championship Game MVP last year. I think the world of Kenneth Grant as as a defensive tackle. And obviously, again, when you're talking about the line of scrimmage, that's the area where Indiana has maybe not seen players with this blend of like size, speed, athleticism, strength, whatever. Like you are for the first time going to be blocking a unit that's probably got multiple NFL players at some point in their careers on the defensive side of the ball in that that front six or in the you know the tackle box, however you want to see that. But Oregon basically what it did was it spread Michigan out defensively by throwing the ball to the perimeter a lot. Uh they threw for I think 294 and a touchdown in that game. And then as that wore Michigan down that was when they started to run up the middle. And that was when they kind of started to pound away in second and short and third and short situations against that Michigan front. So basically what they did was they did not allow, they did not create the, the, the conditions where Michigan's front four or front six could kind of control the game. They took, they took the game away from them and then went back to them when they were, you know, hitting them with some tempo, you know, hitting them with some longer drives and they started hitting them on short yardage situations running the ball up the middle. I think that's relevant, number one, because I think it's pretty clear at this point, no matter what Indiana is doing offensively, rushing the football, Kurt Signetti will always stand on the, the idea that this is a pass first offense. Like think about Taven Jackson. We all thought they'd run the football against Washington and they threw on what, like five of the first six plays or six of the first seven plays or something. Um, and then you also think about, you know, just, this team's personnel and its personality. I wouldn't be shocked, for example, to see Indiana throw a little more tempo in. We saw them do that. And we've seen them do that in, in, in spurts, in moments where it's not just like no huddle. It's not just that you don't huddle. I'm talking about true tempo. You know, you, you, you finish the play and everybody gets up and runs back to the line of scrimmage, no substitutions, no drawn out signaling process from the sideline. Like it's just, it's up to the line call it in on the green dot and go. Um, the, like the, um, the Lost way Oregon Lord. beat Michigan to me, I think very comfortably with some minor tweaks for personnel and whatever and, and scheme and situation, very comfortably sort of overlays onto what Indiana might be able to do this defense. Well, yeah, Michigan couldn't get them off the field. Uh, Oregon was uh, 10 of 15 on third down, um, had some lengthy drives um, and to, to sort of seal the game. They, they, they scored 21 points in the second quarter and kind of, um, you know, ne never uh, – it was double digits the rest of the way through. Um, the, the tempo thing I sort of disagree with. I don't think this team really – wants to do that because they like switching out so much. Um, I don't think they do a ton of it. I just wonder if there'd be some moments when they see the opportunity, if they start wearing that front six down to hit them with it. I mean, maybe, but I just, it's not something that they've really needed to or wanted to do because they've liked rotating the guys out. They like giving different, they like attacking it with different looks as opposed to sort of like the speed of it. Cause people have, I think coaches have sort of figured out that they've adjusted to, to no, you know, tempo stuff. Um, and it's more difficult when you're kind of throwing different looks at them. So maybe, but I just, I, I, they've been so successful with what they've done. Why change it up? Um, you know, I know you're trying to kind of surprise teams, but I don't know if that's, you know, Kurt Signetti seems more like this kind of scheme, the, the success um, than anything else. Um, I mean, did you have a prediction? I mean, are you handily for, for Indiana or you think it's going to be, I think it's going to be closer than the Michigan State game, but I, I still think it's going to be a double-digit win. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I did a, there's a, and I, I, forgive me, I feel bad because I, I suddenly, like the name of it has escaped me, but one of the Michigan websites always asks me to do kind of just like a QA and a uh, when these two teams play, and they finished with a prediction, and I said 27 to 10, and, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if Indiana scores a little more than that, I wouldn't be shocked if Michigan scores a little more than that, but it is, it is kind of more, t- Terry's, Terry's, uh, taking the aggressive route in there in the comments, 44 to 13. Uh, I'm assuming he means an Indiana win. Um, I, I, like, I do think Michigan is going to be able to slow Indiana down. You talk about their ability to pressure the quarterback. That's not something Indiana's really faced. Now, to be fair, we thought, for example, Nebraska would be able to do that to Indiana, and they really weren't. So, you know, like, it's, it's, it, this is, this is again sort of one of those you know, one of those moments where maybe we are one more time really undervaluing what Indiana is capable of. But I just, I do think Michigan's going to be able to slow Indiana down a little bit more, force just a, a, a little bit more discomfort offensively and maybe kind of keep things in check. It is really difficult for me to see Michigan scoring enough points to win this game without Indiana either really playing much more poorly than they have we've seen them play, which is always possible or running into some kind of trouble, like Curtis work re-injures his thumb or, or something, you know, like, or, or you lose like a key piece along the offensive line, some kind of injury you can't, you can't game plan for. I'm like you in the sense that I don't think you're going to beat them by 37 points the way that they beat Michigan state. I think Michigan's a better team. Um, but I just, I, I just like, I look at, I look at all of this and there's not really a, a, like, if you, if you just, let, let's do the brand bias thing briefly. If you just remove the logos and you put these two teams together and you didn't tell anybody who was who and you just gave them the profiles and, and the performances and all that, there's really no path to victory for Michigan. I, do, I don't think. Uh, without, yeah, I, some, without something really unforeseen. To, yeah, to my, my prediction will run tomorrow. I, I had 34-17. I, I don't think it's disrespectful to what Indiana's done. I just think it's respecting the fact that Michigan's defense has has done that all season to teams. I mean, they've just they've not allowed teams to kind of get away with it. Um, and yeah, this is probably the best offense they've faced. Um, and you know, Will Johnson being out is sort of um, you know a big hole to overcome. Um, but you know, in, in, to, to your point, for them to lose, for Indiana to lose, they'd have to turn it over like four to five times. Um, yeah, you know, it's or like, again, like run into some kind of real. Even an injury, I still think they'd have to like have negative plays uh, to the point where you're giving them points. Um, I think it's also like it's it's also really worth pointing out. Number one, Michigan's only been on the road twice this season. I did not realize that. Yeah, they're zero and two on the road. Yeah, at Washington and at Illinois, those are the only two road games they've played this year. Number two, the two teams in the college football playoff currently that they have played: Texas scored thirty-one on them in Ann Arbor. Oregon scored thirty-eight. So like they are capable of giving up a big number relative to what? Well, but I mean that's a bigger number. But I mean it's not. It's not. No, it's it's not forty seven. It's not fifty six. It's not fifty six. And that's my point. Like we're talking. You're talking in terms of like traditionally holding (laughs) good defense could hold a team to under twenty five. I'm saying Indiana is good enough where I think that holding them to thirty four is a pretty good day at the office for these teams. You know, I mean they just obliterated you know most of these Big Ten teams. I would not be surprised if there are a couple of moments in the game where Indiana looks a little bit overpowered by Michigan. But I think there's just just because, again, Michigan's going to have a level of size and strength and athleticism that Indiana's not seen a ton of this year, um, which doesn't reflect very well in the Big Ten, obviously, given that it's November and, and we're, we're talking about this now. But. Again, like Indiana has been so good and so efficient in creating and then converting scoring opportunities that just put opponents in positions where they have to stop doing what they want to do offensively and start doing what they feel like they need to do offensively or or risk completely and totally, you know, fading out. And this Michigan team is not built for that at all. Like this, it is, it is not like last year's Michigan team was so good at, you know, basically game control. And, and I know there are some 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 analytics and, and you know, efficiency numbers that can really kind of uh, measure some of that stuff. But the idea that they would, you know, they, they run, you know, they'd run the ball so well that would give them control of the clock and control of the tempo, and that would let them set up, you know, play action and, 
you know, JJ McCarthy could kind of pick it, pick and choose his spots. And, you know, obviously by, by last season, he was a really good quarterback, you know, an NFL caliber prospect. Like they have none of that this year. And, and then to your point, you know, one or two of maybe the three or four players that they would hope would kind of keep things quiet on Indiana's side when Indiana has a ball, at least one of them probably won't be on the field. Another one might be on the field, but limited. And again, I just, I, like I was, I watched some, uh, some bits and pieces of that Oregon game last week. And then I watched kind of some highlights, you know, just to, just to kind of familiarize myself with it, because frankly, like Oregon is Indiana's comparison as a team right now. Like that's, that's the, the sort of team you should watch playing an opponent in Indiana is about to play. And a lot of what I saw Oregon doing to, to Michigan, the way that it spread Michigan's defense out and then created favorable down and distance. And then that was when they chose to get physical and go downhill and kind of punish Michigan uh, that way. It's just, it's all stuff that a Indiana can do because B I've seen Indiana do it. And then you factor in, it's going to be a great crowd in Bloomington. Of course, like big crowds are not going to be foreign to this Michigan team. That doesn't mean you're never going to be affected by them. It, it is just, like I said, if, if you stripped away the uniforms and, and the, the histories and whatever else, and you just said, which of these teams has a, a, a path to victory, it's really hard to argue for Michigan. Yeah. And I think that's a good spot. We got people talk about the playoffs in the comments. Uh, I know you wanted to kind of reset our discussion um, from, what, Tuesday night now? The, the day's all yeah. fun to get. Um, so of, uh, well, we get the eighth, 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 so uh, eighth number eight ranking, but number nine seed uh, Indiana does in the first college football playoff rankings. Um, that has them uh, visiting Knoxville for a first round game against Tennessee. Um, and then the winner of that would play Oregon. Um, the committee, uh, we got on a conference call and asked Ward Manuel, Manuel about it. He, asked, he answered a couple, uh, the Michigan athletic directors, the committee chair. Yeah, he answered a couple questions about Indiana, said they really like, Indiana's body of work in terms of, you know, he, he mentioned their average margin of victory. He mentioned some of the defensive statistics we've talked about, uh, mentioned the offensive consistency, but the sort of, uh, you know, 300 pound elephant is that they have a strength, strength of schedule. That's like not just worse than the rest of the field, like way, like way worse. Yeah, they're, they're in the hundreds. The only other team outside the top 70, according to ESPN is Notre Dame. Yeah, and so um, that sort of weighed, and he sort of said, like, look, we're keeping an eye on, uh, you know, this Michigan game and this Ohio State game. He didn't say he just said the next four to five weeks, but it's clear to me that they want to see how, I think, this two-game stretch um, to see what they do. Because I, I think even a loss where they play Ohio State close, you know, proves that they're at, at that level. Um, but I mean, you know, you wrote about it a, a couple of different times. What were your kind of thoughts here to reset the, the playoff discussion? Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote something that will actually go live tomorrow. I wrote it today where I just kind of said like from a 10,000 foot view, Indiana is going to present a fascinating test case because the committee is kind of dealing with these, these two, like we're, it's dealing with sort of like multidimensional shifts in what it's got to deal with. One shift is the playoff is three times larger so they can be a little bit more liberal, a little bit more forgiving with the way they consider teams. And they can look at one team and say, you've got a loss, but you played a really tough schedule. So we're going to put you, like Georgia, we're going to put you up here. You don't have any losses, but you, and you, you know, you haven't played a great schedule, but you've looked incredibly impressive doing it. So we're going to, you know, we're going to put you right here in the middle. And I'll be honest, I, 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 my guess is if Indiana wins Michigan, let's say basically any combination of two wins in the last three, because I think even losing to Purdue, it would probably cancel out winning at Ohio State, but I think that winning at Ohio State would keep Indiana afloat enough, even in that kind of disaster scenario. I think two wins in three years keeps Indiana in the playoff, personally. With the, the key market points for me were, one, they put them ahead of BYU, but two, more importantly, they put them ahead of Notre Dame. So they, they took the, they took a team with a, with a bad loss, a better win, and the only team with a a remotely similar schedule, and they put them a couple spots lower. I think the committee has opened the door, has has widened the path for Indiana to win two of these last three and get into the playoff somewhere. Maybe they won't post, but somewhere, um, as long as they finish eleven and one. But the the wider sort of issue to me is like there are going to be more seasons like this, where the best teams and conferences don't play each other because we are expanding these conferences 
so large now. Like in the ACC, Miami does not play any of the three teams chasing it in the regular season, not one of them. In the Big 12, Iowa State and BYU, who are, the, if I'm not mistaken, right now the two highest ranked Big 12 teams in the playoffs, top 25, the community's top 25, they could only play in the Big 12 championship game. I found the it was a statistic from, I think it was 20, I think it was 2019, maybe. Uh, or no, excuse me, it was 2021. In 2021, four of the top five Big Ten teams, there were five Big Ten teams in the FPI, top 20. Four of them all played in the East. Three of them won at least one game against the the like the only team in the East and that big four in the East that did not win a single game against the other three was Penn State. And it lost those games by nine, four, and three. The point was the Big Ten used to be on the opposite end of the spectrum where it had centralized way too much of its power in the Big Ten East. And those teams beat up on each other. And the Big Ten never got to a situation or rarely got to a situation where it could put like two undefeated teams or maybe a 12 and 0 and an 11 and 1 in Indianapolis and make a case that both should go to the college football playoff. And that was why only I think, one time did the Big Ten get multiple teams in, in the four team field. Now we've seen because of the way these conferences have expanded, we are seeing, and we, I think we're going to continue to see more seasons like this where Ohio State plays the other three, but Oregon, Penn State, and Indiana do not play each other all year in the regular season. And so I think that from a from the 10,000-foot view, I think that it's a fascinating test case for the committee to say, what do you do with a team that has a really weak strength of schedule because the games that needed to hold that strength of schedule up in the conference, Nebraska, Michigan, maybe Washington, just didn't do that but looks so impressive in beating those teams that they're hard to ignore. And I just, I find it kind of, I kind of find the committee handling Indiana in this first run through a 12 team playoff fascinating for that reason. Well, I think they would say that whatever they do doesn't matter because the next year is a new year and that they start the slate clean and that, that they just look at what each team did that year. So it doesn't matter what the precedent I just, would be. There would be a precedent setting kind of thing. I, I, but I think we're going to see another team pop up like this. I mean, you're going to see teams in a similar situation, yes, but I don't know. Miami's they... in a similar situation right now, frankly. Miami? I think, they played, I think they've played Louisville, but, you know, that's it. And Louisville's on the fringes of the top 25 in the playoff and the, the committee rankings. But again. I mean, the, the, so, I mean, I guess the question is, I mean, really, I think Indiana has a, uh, a case. I mean, I mean, look, it all gets sorted out, but in terms of these first rankings – the Tennessee, Penn State, Indiana trio is sort of what um, it catches my attention. Should Indiana have been ranked ahead of um, them? And when you kind of look at their resumes, like, look, Indiana, I think, is definitely getting punished for ha not having a non-conference schedule. Um, uh, and, I mean, it just the the dregs of the earth. I mean, like Tennessee at NC State. Uh, um uh, Penn State played at West Virginia. You know, Miami not played Florida. You know, not you know, Georgia, not the Georgia top teams. Yeah, but those are teams with a pulse. And Indiana played just a just you know probably the worst one of the worst non conference schedules of a, of a Power Four team. Um, Tennessee, you know, has quality. I mean, they won at Oklahoma, at Arkansas, they beat Alabama. Um, I thought Tennessee lost to Arkansas. Or lost to Arkansas. Sorry, they yeah, won that's, at Oklahoma. That's the one that's kind of holding Tennessee down. Uh, but it was a close game, 1914. Obviously, beat Alabama, uh, beat Florida, um, and then Penn State. You know their their Big Ten schedule. You know wins against Illinois at USC at Wisconsin, which is a better team than Northwestern uh, that Indiana beat, and you know obviously played a one possession game against Ohio State. What do you make of Indiana coming behind those two teams? Because I think that's kind of the that was sort of the key to me, the where people were saying brand bias and things like that. Um, I, I was just curious your impressions. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the committee, like the committee will know whether it says it or or not, that the way it, it sorts teams out now, it, it gives itself certain outs. So like, for example, Tennessee still has to play at Georgia. And I suspect that if Tennessee loses at Georgia and Indiana loses at Ohio State and Indiana's on one win or one loss, 
and Tennessee's on two. I think at that point, as long as Indiana wins, you know, kind of competitively at Ohio State, then I think Indiana jumps Tennessee. But if Tennessee beats Georgia, then the committee has presented Tennessee the opportunity to say, we're going to put you in a position where if you go on the road and win this really big game against one of the other teams in the 12, we've opened the path for you to jump further up. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like to, to, because that, if I'm not mistaken, that would put Tennessee in the driver's seat to go to the SEC championship game. There are a number of games that still have to sort out. Obviously, IU at Ohio State, uh, but also Alabama at LSU, Texas at Texas A&M. Uh, you know, I think the Iowa State losing last weekend probably really makes it difficult for the Big 12 to get two teams in. I think that's, I think right now and where Kansas State is, because Kansas State's what, like 21, I think, something like that. I think it's really hard. Uh, I think it's really hard to to, to make a, a case for the Big Twelve getting having a path to get two teams in. And that was again where I thought it was important that Indiana was ahead of BYU because that tells me BYU can't lose a game and Indiana lose a game, and BYU move ahead of Indiana. If that makes if that makes sense. And I suppose maybe they could if they win the Big Twelve title game. But if they do that, then they're probably knocking. Then it's very hard to see an at-large Big 12 team coming in behind BYU. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, like, I think the, the point is, I think the committee put Indiana, and I don't think the committee, obviously the committee was not designing this all around Indiana, and the committee to some extent probably wasn't even thinking quite as, as second, third level as we are now. But with what is still yet to shake out, you know, one of Alabama or LSU is going to have three losses. Texas is going to have two, or Texas a and is going to have what, three? Does a and have three or two? I can't remember right now. Or one or two losses right now. I can't remember. You know, Tennessee may very well lose another game. Indiana gets a chance to play a team ahead of it in the rankings here in about, what, like two and a half weeks. There are just enough sort of moments where this conti- this this will further clarify itself organically that I think if Indiana wins – Two of its last three. I, I just think I think they're comfortably in. And then you know, let's Here's see you a Terry, Terry, Terry just asked about uh, or said playing Michigan will move us above several teams in strength of schedule. Um, and I don't know how far it'll move them. But my question to you is: so Penn State, I, th- I think the key here is that Indiana wants to jump Penn State, especially if it's if they have one loss on Ohio State. Do you think a win over Michigan jumps Indiana over Penn State? In next week's rankings, who does Penn State play this weekend? Washington. Yeah, I mean, not if, not if Penn State beats Washington. I don't think, but I would point out, Penn State's got two tricky games left. They got Washington at home, and then they have to go to Minnesota on November twenty third. And Minnesota is. Either Minnesota or Iowa is basically the best of the rest at this point in the conference because Illinois is faded. Nebraska's in a tailspin. You know, Michigan's never really kind of gotten its 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 feet under the table this season. So Penn State's got like Penn State's quietly got kind of a tricky road, and they don't have a bye. Like Oregon gets a bye. So there's no way. So in your mind, if if uh, Indiana goes two and one, there's no way to jump Penn State if Penn State goes undefeated the rest of the way. I don't think so. Personally, I don't. Mean, to me, it means that they're probably going to be always be on the road. Like I feel like that. I think, think I think I think that may well be the case. I think that like I think that may well be reality. That, but then, like it's a fascinating test case to me how the committee handles ten and two Tennessee versus eleven and one Indiana. Because ten, let's say Tennessee goes to Athens and loses, which is I'm you know that that is that would be yeah. Because I bet you're basically in the same situation you are now, essentially. Yeah. And, but, so like, and it just feels like that they're behind slightly. And if you don't think that a Michigan win can push them ahead, that they're going to be stuck going on the road in the first round. And that seems to me, that's, that's I think, my problem with it, that ultimately that feels like where it's heading unless they beat Ohio State, that I feel like this team has played well enough to serve to host a game in the first round. Maybe. And, you know, remember that as things stand, the reason they don't host in the first round right now is because of a technicality, which is that there's a team behind them that by the rules of the 
by the jumps. seeding rules as they stand, jumps them because it gets the automatic buy. BYU gets the automatic buy as the fourth highest rated conference champion. Whoever comes out of the Big 12, BYU, I guess, can play its way into the top four, but it seems unlikely. Based on where things are, I think it's probably likelier than not that whoever is in the Big 12, whoever wins the Big 12, is going to take that number four spot from a lower ranking and bump everybody down one rung. So, the, you know, Indiana is in basically the next four, if you want to think about it that way. And it's the fourth one, which means it's the one that gets bumped into um, – it's the one that gets bumped into the – Terry, I'll look that up in just a second. The top uh, Big Ten team in the quarterfinals gets the Rose Bowl. Okay, I, did, I couldn't remember if the Rose Bowl was a quarterfinal or a semifinal. So they do – so that uh, – the, like the SEC still gets the sugar too, I think. So like some of yeah, the old, it's, it's, Each one is assigned to the to, to, to lead. Yeah. Um, but the point is it's it, – it, Indiana is at the very edge of hosting and it gets bumped down on a technicality. I think, um, I think personally it is hard if like the one question I would have is what the committee does with 10 and two Tennessee compared to 11 and one Indiana in your scenario. And if they, if they, if they give Tennessee enough credit, for losing at Georgia to keep them ahead of Indiana, then Indiana would basically wind up the highest seeded road team. And that's harsh to an extent. But what I would point out is like, you're trying to be one of 12 teams out of 133, 134 in the FBS. Like at a certain point, you know, you, you just kind of have to acknowledge that like the hill, you know, the climb is steepest at the top. I mean like this, you know, and we, we get into well, this. I think, and, yeah. I mean, Yes, yes, it, it, it's yes, but I think it would be a sign where Indiana will have to like if they want to play at this level, they can't do this with the non-conference schedule going forward. That they can't just. No, and listen, I don't think you can fault them for what they did last year. Like they were. No, I'm not saying, but I mean, like, like you agree, right? They'd have to start making some yeah. changes to sort of, um, like, look, if Sigdani wants to be this at this level, you can't play less than nobody in the non-conference schedule. Yeah. Do you think – well, here's – here's, 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 It's an anvil on them. I mean, Western Illinois, I mean, geez, come on. Do you think they would be ahead of Penn State and or Tennessee if they'd beaten Louisville on the road? Yes. I think so, too. I But I, th I think it'd be close. I don't think it would be like, oh, obviously – they're ahead of these two teams, but I do think they – I think they would be – I think it would have given Louisville. them an easy data point to say, like, look, they want a tough non-conference game on the road. Yeah. Um, and the, this they, they've proved themselves early in the season, and they'd be – yeah. yeah, and that's fair, and I think that is a philosophical discussion that, like, Scott Dolson and Kurt Signetti need to sit down and hash out, whether it's for next season or just, you know, more broadly moving forward. Like, if you um, – I'm, I'm Googling future college football schedules – um, on fbschedules.com. If you look at Indiana next year, next year, I mean, next year, they drop their I mean, game, game off year. next year. They've got the they got to finish the UConn series the year after that. Um, they have the Virginia series starting in 27. And I, I know you, we don't want to spool this out too much, but then but they have let's Virginia talk about and, okay, like this. The, like, if I say they get in the playoff this year, they have to change next. I mean, I don't know how they could, I don't know if there's any team like Old Dominion. Kennesaw State, which is one in seven right now, and Indiana State. That is a, a another and you anchor. Drop, and you drop they have Kennesaw much tougher. State. That's the that's that's, 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 Pam, that's, 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 that's that's Pam Witten. That's that's Pam Witten's old school against her new school. I mean, it's like having. I mean, all Terra. I guess I'd have to make the call to Paradise, and just tell them, "We'll get you down the road." And maybe they don't change it because they do have five road games next year and they do at Iowa, Oregon, and Penn State. So, I mean, yeah, but, I mean, and, those, those non-conference schedules are just refuse to accept the possibility that you can plan a game, like, more than – fewer than five years in advance, even though we did it in COVID all the time. Yeah, you mean – COVID, it was like, our game got called off for next week. Who's around? Like, it was like hanging out in a college town in summer. It's just like, hey, we haven't seen each other in a while, but we're both bored. Like – it clearly can be done, but – and I think that's – even that's kind of a fascinating test case of if if a team like Indiana or a team like BYU 
says, hey, actually, it turns out this is a lot more realistic ambition for us than maybe we would have thought, you know, before we experienced the intersection of NIL and the portal and the 12 team playoff and whatever. Can we make some some quick adjustments to our schedules to try and give ourselves more opportunity? Because, again, I come back to the point I made at the front end of this, which was this is going to happen more often. If you've got 16, 17, 18 team conferences, you are going to get more seasons than you would have in the era of even 12 and 14 team conferences where you just aren't able to match up the teams that you need to play each other in your own conference to sort of to sort out who's the best because the schedules are just so unbalanced. And like, you know, when we sat down to the schedule, let's be fair, when we sat down to the schedule in the preseason, we said the only two games we thought Indiana absolutely couldn't win or in all likelihood, you know, barring something unforeseen, couldn't win were Michigan and Ohio State. So it wasn't like we didn't look at the schedule in the, in the preseason and say, hey, we, you know, this is pretty favorable to Indiana. But the what's changed is Indiana's taken the schedule and basically maxed it out completely. And that's where I think you ask, okay, you know, you need to be strategic about it. You don't want to hand yourself a schedule that's just brutal and wind up eight and four or seven and five when maybe against a, a more forgiving schedule you'd be ten and two or better. But you know, where you can be kind of strategic, you need to sort of restore some of the toughness in your non con yeah, and um, Terry was saying that the Big Ten portion of the schedule will be harder, and I and I did add that that they that that, that is true. But I mean, well, you got to look at what the other the you know uh, the competition's playing, right? If you're going to be measured against uh, Oregon and Ohio State, Ohio State plays Texas next year. Uh, Oregon um, plays Oklahoma State and Oregon State in the non-conference. Um, so I mean, you know, you just I think you need more, a little more from your non-conference than what they've kind of scheduled out here. Um, you know, and look, obviously it's a good problem to have, but um, you, you've seen the impact of it. You've seen the impact of it. Yeah, Terry, I guess to, to finish up here, if you win, does it really matter? I mean, I think to a certain extent, no. If you win 11 games in the Big Ten, you will almost certainly be in the playoff. Like, the, you know, I think if, if we ran out, you know, a thousand simulations of a twelve of a season with a twelve team playoff. I suspect the um, the vast majority of them, any eleven win Big Ten team would get in. The question would be: Are you playing at home? Are you playing on the road? Do you have an opportunity to go play for a conference title? You know, do you have an opportunity to play for a buy? And it's worth saying to kind of finish this off because a lot of this conversation by its nature and the theory behind it has to be framed around the idea that Indiana doesn't win out. If Indiana wins out and goes 12 and 0, then this is all off the table. Indiana is probably at worst 12 and 1. Like the worst case scenario if Indiana wins its last three regular season games to me is that it goes to Indianapolis, loses to Oregon and is the 5 seed. And is probably a top 4 seed overall. That doesn't really matter because they don't reseed the bracket. Like there's no point where they they, they take everybody and, and throw them back in and say, you know, we were one through 12, now we're one through eight or whatever. But um, it'll be the highest team hosting a hosting. A yes, game. they will host a first round game as the, the highest seeded team. And obviously, if they win the conference championship, as Terry says there, they get the automatic buy. I mean, if they, if any of pulled that off, they'd probably be the number one seed in the playoff field. I, I, I find it hard. Well, to there's win. no question. Yeah. Um, so there is also that. But the reason we frame this hypothetical discussion around losing at Ohio State or, you know, maybe even like losing, like you can kind of get into it and we're running along. I want to, I want to shut this down in a minute, but you can get into all sorts of hypotheticals. Like what if they lose to Michigan, but they beat Ohio State and Purdue, I think they'd actually be in a better position with the committee if they lose to Michigan at home, but then go beat Ohio State. But if they beat Michigan and Ohio State, but then lose to Purdue, I think the committee would probably see Ohio State and Purdue as just watching, washing each other out. So um, if they lost to Purdue, I, something, uh, something terrible will have happened. Like it, it would be, I mean, we it would terrible. like it would be act of God stuff. Like the, the the flagpole would fall over the field and just take out like the entire Indiana sideline. What well, dark um, timeline here that you're imagining? Just, just <laughs> death tag would be starting at wide receiver. Um, but the point is, like, to acknowledge it briefly, if they win at Ohio State, 
then obviously that changes all of the terms of, of this team's resume and its opportunities and how the committee sees it. It's just the hypothetical of if they don't, but they do win out at home, what does their path look like in the college football playoff? So uh, any other business? We've gone almost an hour. In fact, we're 15 seconds away from an hour, so I feel like we need to rein this in. But do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, I got to cover a women's basketball game tonight. You have, you have, you get to just make dinner. I'd imagine get some more groceries. No, I don't have. I need groceries. We're gonna make a little, little, little sausage uh, orzo meal. It's very good. Go. Broccoli lady, toss it in there. Your kids don't you like, like broccoli. Why are you throwing the broccoli in there? Broccolini, it's not just broccoli. It's broccolini. Uh, well, I have no uh, idea. Right, we'll finish with this. Terry Davis, two words. Indiana basketball game last night, good or bad? Watch uh, <laughs> the beginning of this podcast when it gets posted and last night's podcast. <laughs> that's, that's a lot more than two words. I would say in two words, two words isn't many words. Um, <laughs> gotta improve. <laughs> God, cheater. <laughs> Not as much for cheaters as you. You spit out like a two-sentence answer. All right. He's Mike Nislik. I'm Zach Osterman. This has been Mind Your Banners for Thursday, November 7th, 2024. We'll be back Saturday afternoon or I guess evening because it's a 3.30 kickoff on CBS. IU Michigan, we will be back to wrap that up, whatever happens. And then we will have some sort of postgame podcast after Eastern Illinois on Sunday. Um, maybe won't go as long as we did on Wednesday night, but that was a season opener, so it felt like it deserved a little bit more. Thank you so much for listening. To all who watched live, who participated in the comments, thank you so much for uh, enlivening the discussion. We will be around and talk to you soon.